Well, welcome. Uh, before we begin, I want to, uh, sometimes there's, you have a moment in church when you get to introduce somebody. I remember the day that I got to introduce the kid that I led to the Lord and discipled to the guy that discipled me. And I thought, this was a really cool moment. Uh, I said to my friend, this is your grandson. And he looked at him and thought, that's a weird thing to say. <laughs> he was a spiritual grandson. Today we have Jim Crowder and Sharon Crowder with us, and I want to acknowledge the impact that they had on my life. Uh, and gave me the op- Jim gave me the opportunity to, uh, to teach in high school and to use the spiritual gifts that God gave me and to practice them for years and years. And we became uh, great partners in ministry, and I'm very thankful for him. Jim and Sharon, where are you? You were sitting back there. Stand up. Um, he looks like a guy from a band. What's the band? ZZ Top. ZZ Top. That's, <laughs> he is not that, he is a, but he is a good friend of mine. He could be. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I have a, uh, a blueprint here, and uh, before I became a pastor 10 years ago, I was doing Walmarts and Sam's Clubs, remodeling them around the country, and I continue to remodel Walmarts and Sam's Clubs now as I've moved back towards construction, and uh, there are like 100 pages usually in one of these. This is a Sam's Club. It's in Vestal, New York, and we're about to start. They're a week away from starting this job. And when I first started doing them, a 100-page document would take me, you know, days to get through. I would take a highlighter and highlight every phrase that was in it to see if it was for our company or not for our company and what changed. Well, eventually, it got to where I could get through a blueprint in about an hour, because it was the same again and again. In fact, that's their goal, is when they build a Sam's Club uh, in some town, it looks so familiar, or a Walmart, that when you come to that town, you can spot it just out of the corner of your eye, and you can find the same things that you find in your. It's not exactly the same, but it's similar enough that you feel like, well, this is a Walmart. And it would be like that for Target, but it just so happens that our company does Walmarts and Sam's Clubs. I'm not going to Vestal, New York. I used to travel a ton for my job. I'm not even going to see this job. In fact, we've done 20, Danny would be here to tell me, 26 jobs, I think, so far this year around the country. And I have been to maybe three of them. But the building is being built, being remodeled in a way that's in keeping what Bentonville has decided tells us what to do, and my guys have been so trained, they're almost ruined for doing anything else. They are Walmart guys, and they are Sam's Club guys, and they know exactly what they're supposed to do, and I can explain it to them. They almost don't need it. Sometimes they explain back to me what they're doing. I want to use this as an illustration for the sermon that the Bible has given us, and God has given us a blueprint for life. He's given us an idea and a picture of who we're supposed to be, and ultimately that person is Jesus Christ, who is the blueprint for the life that God intended for us. Sin has entered this world and wreaked havoc on our relationships, on our very being, anxiety, depression, things that God never intended for us to deal with, and the way that we're dealing with them are areas of our lives that have been wrecked by sin. Today's message is about what it means to be the children of God in the way that we live. And I don't want you to miss what this is about. This is an incredible gift. It's a reconstruction plan. In Bentonville, they'll decide every year at the beginning of the year or before then, by the time it gets to us, what are the things we're going to change? We're going to make a snack bar this way. Recently, they've been adding sushi bars. So we're going to put a sushi bar in all of our Sam's Clubs. And that ends up being a couple of stamps that go on every blueprint. And now I know exactly what's involved with a sushi bar. I saw it in Waukesha when we built it in Waukesha. God has given us an imprint, Jesus Christ, of who we should be and what it looks like. And when we depart from that, we allow havoc to continue to rule. We ruin our families, we ruin our relationships, we ruin our businesses, and we ruin our lives. Sin is death. And God came to reconstruct us through Christ. 
and give us life. Our passage today ends in 1 John 2.29 and then uh, begins in 1 John 2.29, ending that chapter, and goes through chapter 3, verse 10. And it's really a continuation of last week. And here's how I would describe the two, compare, the two passages. Last week, we looked at the passage that precedes this, and it was about orthodoxy. That's a word that you're not used to hearing, maybe. It's about what we know about Christ. It's what we need to know and believe about Christ to be a Christian. It's the foundation of being a Christian. It's how you become a Christian. Today, we're looking at orthopraxy, which is how you live out your Christian life. What should happen, can happen, and will happen when you submit your life to Christ as a Christian. And we will end up looking remarkably the same wherever we're planted. There will be things that will identify us as Christians. What does it mean to be Christian? That will be similar whether it's whatever generation, no matter what country you live in, these things are the same. It means God is reconstructing you. Today we're looking at that reconstruction process, that what does it mean to be a child of God now that you are a child of God? So let's read the passage, ending uh, starting in 2.29, ending that chapter, and then through 3.10. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous. And he is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God, And who are the children of the devil, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Here ends the reading of God's word. I broke this passage into three sections. We're going to see that the children of God are alive already and not yet. The children of God increasingly practice righteousness, and the children of God continue to grow in love. Let's Start with that first one. The children of God are alive already and not yet. The passage begins ending our section from last week. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. The the picture is parental in nature. The picture is one where if you see someone who's a follower of God, he's going to look like God. I did a funeral yesterday for Kay Warman Seekerman, if you're familiar, if you remember her as part of our church, and at that funeral, I got to see tons of her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. The horde was 80 strong, and they all talked about the influence that she had and what it meant to be a Warman. It all looked like Kay. And sounded like Kay. They use some of the phrases that Kay uses. There's not a bad one of the bunch, she would say. And the bunch was pretty big. Not a bad one in the bunch was her perspective of all of her family. When it means to be a Christian, it means that you begin to act and think and look like Jesus and other people can recognize you 
as a Christian because of that. Your righteous life begins to look like Christ's righteous life. Now, this first point, I'm going to say this is already and not yet. We're going to see that this is a process. This is something that we are coming alive. It's the fruit of what it means to be Christian. That's what we've been talking about through this series. If you know that he is righteous, if you know that Jesus is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. This relationship, this adoption into God's family, the privilege that we have being called the children of God, it begins and ends and is always a matter of love for the Father to us, from the Father to us. He loves you so much, he sent his son to die for you. He loves you so much, he didn't just say you can take a back seat in the, in the room and you, you, you sinned, you failed, you'll never measure up. He loved you so much that he sees you through the eyes, through the life of Christ and the work of Christ, he sees you as complete and done and you are his loved child of God with unhindered access into his presence because of who he is and what he's done for us. This is all about a loving relationship. Some people might be tempted to hear this sermon and Take it like, like it's a beat down. Oh, my lot. You, you leave here at church today and you say, well, I'm, I'm, am I even a Christian? Look at the sin that's still in my life. Look at the failures. Look at the ways that I need to grow. Well, I got to tell you, that's what I think. I've been walking with the Lord over 40 years and I'm still struggling. In fact, I think when I was young, I thought I was closer to complete than I am now. God's taken ground in my life, but I've gotten to know God better, and I am nowhere near his holiness and righteousness. I have sin that still resides in me. I still have a, a heart that can be angry and hurtful and hurt others. My voice can be used out of one side of it to praise God and another side to curse a person. That's the reality. I am this in-between and yet I am the loved child of God who is offering to change my life. He is offering to come and reconstruct my life. Here's a blueprint. His name is Jesus. And he is willing by the power of the Holy Spirit to do this work in me. And Christian after Christian after Christian say, well, this is good enough. I don't need to get better here. I'm just an angry person. I'm just a lustful person. I'm going to let cha God change a certain amount, but I don't want him, I don't want to stand out in the world as you know holy. I'm just one of the guys. Or do you want to stand up for Christ and let him reconstruct? We are the loved children of God, and this is what motivates us. It's not a motivation based on fear. It's not a motivation primarily based on guilt. It's a motivation built mainly on love, that the Father loves us so much and we love him back and want to live for him. He goes on to say that the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. It means that the world didn't accept or receive Jesus Christ. So why would he expect it to notice when we're walking with the Lord or applaud us when we're doing what's right or following the rules? Sometimes following the rules makes other people angry. Sometimes doing what's right makes other people angry. When I was in high school, my job was, uh, was to be in the back room at Crocs and Brentano's, which is a bookstore at Randers. And my job was to get the books unpacked and get them set out on the shelves, to send back the books that they didn't sell and they were sent back to, the, to the, whoever was receiving them. So I was boxing a lot. And there was a guy that I was witnessing to, and he was a group that I would not know. He was, you know there was a place in my day that you could smoke, the smoker's lot, and he was a guy that was in the smoker's lot. He smoked cigarettes. He was a guy that did drugs, so he was a burnout, which is what we called those guys in my day. He was a burnout. He hung with a different group of people. He was a broken young man, 17 years old. 
and we're walking through Randhurst, and I'm walking along telling him about Jesus while he's old, you know, what, looking at girls and thinking inappropriate thoughts and saying them to me as, he's, as we're walking. And I'm telling him about Jesus, and I reach around. They have this little popcorn stand where they're selling popcorn, and I reach around, and I grab a piece of popcorn and pop it in my mouth. And that has stuck with me to this day for a very unique reason. He scolded me. Here's this guy who has, he's doing drugs at night, he's angry at his parents, can't stand them, he's got all of this brokenness in his life, and he says, you're a Christian, you're not supposed to steal. And what I wanted to say, it's just a piece of popcorn. What's the big deal? The funny thing is the world may not recognize you or applaud you for being a Christian, but make no mistake, the world knows what we're supposed to look like. We're supposed to be loving. We're supposed to be forgiving. We're supposed to be kind. We're supposed to be compassionate. We're supposed to give to the poor, just like Jesus did. Why are not people flooding to churches? Could it be that Christians don't look like Christ as one of the reasons? Yeah, it might annoy it. Same job I'm working and I'm working how my dad trained me. Work is under the Lord and I'm, I was raised in a good family. So I'm working hard and I'm trying to fill up all of my time. And a, a guy who was older comes up to me and says, God, stop making the rest of us look bad. Slow down. What does it mean to work like a Christian? I actually made him angry by working hard. And unfortunately, what I did was slow down. He was older. And I got bad habits in my work, and my dad noticed them and was not happy with me. The world sees us and knows how we should live, but doesn't necessarily applaud us for living the way that we should. That's what the passage is saying. They rejected Jesus. Don't be surprised if they reject you for doing what's right. But again, based on love, again, verse 2, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. This is a hugely important verse to understand this passage. It's this already not yet piece that it means to be a Christian. It means that we are not complete It means that there is still brokenness us. We're still fallen. We still need forgiveness. You might come to church and think, I'm the only messed up one here. And I'm here to tell you, I'm on your team. I'm messed up too. I am in process. There is sin that easily besets us. Why would the scriptures even say there's sin that easily besets us? Because as Christians, there is sin that sometimes torments us and tempts us, and we return to it, and maybe gossip is the thing, or the judgment is the thing that you wrestle with. And we know that's not what it's supposed to be, but we wrestle time and again, and you might be tempted to say to yourself, this is as good as it gets. I'm just going to die a gossip. I am an angry man. That's all there is to it. There's no redemption for me on this front. I'm going to find redemption in the areas that are easier. Well, I'm here to tell you that there is an already not yet, but the argument of this sermon is that practicing sin, settling in and saying this is good enough, is not the already that we want. We are already filled by the Holy Spirit, and you can overcome the next sin that the Lord puts in front of you. I have found this to be one of the gracious, most gracious things about our God. He gives me one thing to work on at a time. It was asked to me a long time ago, would you want a report card from God how you're doing? And I thought about it a long time, and I thought, I do not. I do not want to know the whole score. I want to know out of his gracious, loving hands once he wants me to do next. What's next? You might have 15 things, and honestly, Satan can use that to thwart you from doing anything. Ask the Lord, what next? And trust God and the Holy Spirit to overcome that sin in your life. 
Let me ask you a question. No, no raising of hands and no responding right, responding right now. Put it down there. Have you overcome a sin in the last year? I promise you, you have sin in your life. You have not arrived. Is God at work in your life sanctifying you? Or are you content? Is this as good as it gets? Ask the Lord what next. Your loving Heavenly Father has come to your town to reconstruct you. Are you willing to be reconstructed? Children of God are alive already and not yet. Oh, I didn't read verse, the end of verse 3. And everyone who, who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. They allow that reconstruction process that God alone can do. The second point, the children of God increasingly practice righteousness. Verse 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. What is this lawlessness and why does that even matter to us? Well, let's take a moment and consider the law of God. The Ten Commandments are this, no other gods before me, no graven images or likenesses, not take the Lord's name in vain, remember the Sabbath day, honor thy father and thy mother, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, and thou shalt not covet. Those would be the Ten Commandments found in Exodus 20, verses 1 to 17. Notice that in the commandments, they can fall into two parts, the way I think of it. There is our relationship with God, and there is a relationship with each other. What does a God follower look like? Someone who is moving closer to God, and someone who is loving others the way God sent him to do so, or her. Those would be the Ten Commandments. Why not covet? Because don't do that to someone that God loves. Why don't steal? Because the Lord gave that to that person. It's not yours. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment is, sum it up for us, Lord. By a lawyer in Matthew 22, 37 to 40, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. When we read in this passage, someone who's practicing sinning is also practicing lawlessness. That means you are offending the living God because you are not pursuing God and you are not loving others. Why does it matter so much to God that we love each other? That we're kind to each other? Why is that such a big deal? Why are we supposed to show compassion to each other and grace to each other? Why is that a mark of a Christian? In fact, that's what Jesus said before he he left. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for each other. It's not just didn't steal a piece of popcorn or cheat or lie or commit adultery. It's love. And the picture is that God loves us so much that he chose us and wants us to tell the world and put his love on display. When someone comes into a gathering of Christians, they should feel and sense the love of God among us. It should be increasing. We should be growing in our love for each other. This should be in our homes. This should be in our friendships. This is what it means to be Christian. It is all centered on being connected and, lo- and, and knowing God and being connected with each other and loving each other because we love God. And the Holy Spirit is the one who empowers our relationship with God and empowers our relationship with each other. When you do a remodel, uh, there is, uh, I don't understand low voltage, and I don't understand how it's done. Somebody here maybe can tell me, uh, right? Uh, but if we unplug a cooler and it gets above a certain temperature, Bentonville, Arkansas is alerted even though it's Vestal, New York. 
and they call us right away. You have a cooler, your, stuff, your product's going to go bad. You have a cooler that's down. They know when sales drop. And they said, have you done your dust walls right? Have you, prepared, have you been gracious around customers or is construction starting to inhibit sales? It's all run by Bentonville. And I don't want to in any way make Walmart a Christian company. I could tell you about Walmart. I'm not going to bite the hand that feeds me. I'm here to tell you that the living God is in touch with everything that you're doing. And if you're willing to pick up the line and talk to him and read your Bible, he's going to tell you. You know, you're off in the way you're thinking about that. You know, the emotion that you're experiencing, the unforgiveness in your heart, the anger, the spite, the envy, it's not for you. You were meant for so much more. You were meant to flourish. You were meant to be a source of love, a source of hope, a source of peace. These are the signs of life. The children of God are increasingly practicing righteousness. That means we are not there yet, but we are not akin to lawlessness. In verse 5, it says, You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Again, make no mistake that Jesus Christ is the blueprint by which we compare everything. If we want to know how to live this life, Jesus is the one who lived it perfectly, and we look at his life in the scriptures and we say, Am am I like that? To be a Christian means to be little Christ's wherever he's planted us, Vestal, New York, or Algonquin, Illinois. Barrington or Lake in the Hills or wherever you're planted. You are called to be Christ in your situation. In verse 7 it says, Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous and he is righteous. As he is righteous. As Christ is righteous, we're practicing righteousness. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. This makes me very uncomfortable because I confess in front of you often I struggle. I can struggle with unforgiveness. I can get shy on compassion. I can be spiteful. I can be selfish. Ooh, I can be self-centered. Sin still resides in me, and I look back at me as a young man thinking, this isn't going to be the way that it's going to be. It's going to be like three years from now, I am going to be an amazing Christian willing to die for my faith. I didn't know I was going to struggle with sin and hurt people. Oh, the people I've hurt. The people I've had to apologize to. My own family, on a regular basis, having to apologize to them. What does this mean? No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. That means that we go and apologize. That means that we have this already, we are children of God, but we are not yet who we are called to be. And as we're working this out, we work it out in the the field of community. We do it in relationships that God has given us. And in those relationships, we are practicing being Christian. And when we fail, we don't justify. We don't say it's your fault. Have you ever heard the apology that justifies? I'm sorry, but you made me mad. Well, you haven't said sorry. I'm sorry, but really it's not my fault. I am here to tell you as a Christian, own your garbage and get better by the power of God. Get better. Practice the Christian life. Live it out. We were meant to become more like Christ. We were meant to be a community that encouraged us to become more like Christ. This subject 
what I prayed is I've seen the danger on both sides of this discussion. I've seen churches become legalistic. There's a list of 10, 15 things that if you're any of these things, then you can't be in our community. You're a failure. You can't swear, you can't smoke, you can't chew, and you can't go with girls who do. I've seen the community, and it's legalistic. It's not taking into account that God picks us up at different places and begins the work with us, and have we gracious enough to accept people as they are and love them into the kingdom. Legalism will not work out because Jesus wasn't legalistic. If anybody had the opportunity to be legalistic, it was Jesus. The opposite failure is license. Hey, it doesn't matter what you do. Jesus loves you. He'll forgive you. That's the equivalent of being a doctor that telling somebody that has a heart condition, it doesn't matter, just keep eating Big Macs. That isn't love. You think that's love? That's not love. Love says cut it out. Stop it. Grow up. Grow into the faith that God has given you. Don't you know how much your father loves you and don't you have any idea of what he intended for your life? You were meant to thrive. You were meant to be a source of thriving for the people around you. You weren't meant to just survive. The children of God are alive already and not yet. The children of God increasingly practice righteousness. The children of God continue to grow in love. He has been beating love over our head through the whole book. You notice that? And he's not done. In fact, it's going to pick up some steam. In verse 10, it says, By this is, is evident that who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. All right, I want to pause here for a moment and talk about the danger of trying to figure out who's saved and who isn't. We look through a very faulty lens. I look at the people who have, in Scripture, at times done things that are horrific. And it was never asked of them, did you ever believe in Jesus in the first place? I'll take you to 1 Corinthians. It's just one of them. A guy who is, has an inappropriate relationship with somebody in his family. I won't get any more descriptive of that. You'll have to go and read it yourself. And he is... Told, they told the leadership, because you have accepted this lifestyle, we're asking you to move him out of your community. But there's never a question about, is he really saved? I hear this often. Is that guy really saved? Is that girl really saved? We don't know. That's not our job even. We're not the creator. We're not the ones who are the judge. We're not the ones who are, who are decide if somebody's sin is enough to disqualify them or may, may mean that they never believe. That's not our job. Our job is to love each other and spur each other on. And if someone lives a lifestyle that we're not sure that they're saved, ask them. Fight for them in a loving way. You might think this verse gives you license to judge each other. Well, that's counter to everything I've been preaching so far, just so you know. We put on display our love for each other by how we... When Paul, who wasn't saved and was struck down by Jesus, and he's now, now on the road to Damascus, and one guy risks his life by going to love Paul and draw him in. Picture that as our job. We're risking it all because we love people. We're not trying to move people away. So why this verse? This is evident. Who are the children of God? Who are the children of the devil? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. What does that mean? I think this is about abiding and us doing a self-reflection and loving reflection in each other's lives as disciplers of each other, as reconstructors of each other. It's our job to be involved in each other's lives and cause us to become the people that God intended us to be. So what does that look like? That means that if you, if you have somebody in your life that you hurt, like you ache over their well-being, that's love. 
It's not taking shots from the cheap seats. It's not glancing at somebody and saying, by the way, you're failing. I was at Timberley one time, and there was a young man who came with us in our youth group who had a, a button on his shirt that had a swear word on it. And actually, the button described his life. It was pretty awful. And another leader came up to me lovingly. She handled it really well. She said, should I talk to the young man about what he's wearing? And I said, that is the least of his concerns. Just love him. What is the church? What are we called to do? We are sent, in my case, to Algonquin, Illinois, on Kingsbury Court to be reconstructed and to be in the reconstruction business. The picture has been the same for 2,000 years of what it looks like. You can find it in the Word of God if you care to look. Dear children, do you have any idea how much the Father loves you and what he intended for you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how cool that I get to call you that. Forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for the ways that I've let my church community down. And I pray that you would make us children that by the power of your spirit who come alive so that we can tell others about you. In Jesus' name, amen.